Welcome to the Bigfoot Society. In this archival episode from 2023, I talked to Ken Metzger about the many Bigfoot encounters he's gathered in the wild state of Montana. If you've experienced something similar to what Ken has or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same area, please reach out immediately after this episode. And if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please contact me directly at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Also, make sure you check out BigfootSocietyPodcast.com where you can become a member and get extra episodes. All right, Bigfoot Society got the uh, privilege of talking to a new friend tonight, Mr. Ken Metzger from the Montana Bigfoot International Research Group. How's it going, Ken? It's going real good. Like I was telling you, we're gearing up for this year's field research trips in Montana, possibly Colorado, Oregon, and Idaho again. I love it. So a few uh, quick words about Ken. He is a Bigfoot researcher out there in Montana, and he's got some really interesting stories. Ken, is there anything else that our listeners would need to know about you to set the stage before we start chatting? I've had, I've come to believe now, encounters with Bigfoot when I was young in the mountains, when I used to take off and go camping, things I'd see structures, something large walking away, bipedal. So I've been around it for a long time, and I really didn't get into it until my first sighting in 1978. I have to know what I saw, especially when you know it's not a bear. It's just, it's, it has intrigued me. It's become a quest for me. I hiked into an alpine lake out of Deborah, Montana, Crystal Lake, and I spent the day fishing. Coming out, I had seen bear scat and everything. So you become cautious, especially when you're carrying trout. And I could hear a log being torn apart off this old logging road. So I stopped, dropped, put the creel on my shoulders. I could drop it if I had to. What walked up on the road was not a bear. It was walking upright. And it was, I'd estimate, between seven and a half to eight and a half foot tall. It was covered in short black hair, long muscular arms, a barrel chest, the legs were muscular. The hands appeared to have no hair on them, as did the feet. The face, how do you say? It? The head was rounded with small ears, and when it turned its head, you could see it from crude eyebrows. The nose was somewhat flat. The mouth was a little bit open, but you could see the bottom two dog teeth. Looked at me, and then went up a steep bank. In two steps, it was up a real steep bank. And then started parallel the road. Of course, I figured it was time to get out of there, which I did, and then I stopped and I built a little rock thing and I've always been taught you go out you always return something so I dropped some trout by it and I mm. left now you're talking this is a seven and a half mile hike in and out so you're talking 15 miles round trip and I was the only one in there and there's been reports of that area a lot sightings up in that area in the hog and Borgia area tree knocks visuals I'd have them knock on the side of the house when I lived up there. All of the night, yeah, you hear real quick raps. So if we knew they were out there. You could smell them. Cutting fire, would you take a break? All of a sudden, you hear real sharp tree knocks. And it wasn't the wind knocking trees. Getting in the mountains too much to be able to know that. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea Montana was so squatchy, to be honest. We have, I got reports from the Missouri Breaks, Cut Bank, Sydney, the Big Hole. The Bear Tooth, the Bob Marshall, the Pintler Selway area, Bigfoot sightings. And there's not many groups in Montana that's going out there because there's no guarantee we're going to find anything. There's always that chance. There's always that chance that having a kind of giving an example. We didn't know we had captured that juvenile. And that's been verified as an unknown bipedal creature. It's not a bear or a human. Just prior to that, something large was smelling the window of the mortar home where the wife was sleeping. She woke up. She didn't wake me up. She got up, went out in the dining room, side because the blinds were up. She went and laid back down. She didn't wake me up. But she got up, and I got up and asked what was wrong. She told me. She said she heard it walk away, heavy footsteps. So the wow. next morning, I went out and measured from the flat of the ground to where she pointed on the when it was nine and a half feet, you put a creature 10 foot or better at the same time, that small one at six foot was standing by the Jeep. Listeners, if you want to check out this video, you just go to the Montana Bigfoot Research Group dot com. Yeah. And it is on there for you to view. 
Uh, but I'll definitely have that link in the show notes as well. I've watched it more than a few times <laughs> myself. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I, little, I really don't know. Yeah, a little bit of the history of that area. Jeff, which is a co-founder, he's the one that actually got me to open up the Montana Bigfoot International Research Group because of his curiosity. And now my primary re online researcher is out of Malaysia. He worked for oh, the wow. Canadian Forest Service. He sends me what he finds, and we post it on our Facebook site. And um, they're up there. What caught Jeff's eye was the footprints in the snow that just wandered off on a main game trail. And then his son was down by where we normally have our base camp, playing with the dog, and also a big rock was thrown into the water, and something bipedal walked away. And every time we go up there, something happens. So I continue going to the area because there is activity. You'll hear, it sounds like a screech owl, but it's not a screech owl. You'll hear coyotes, but they're not coyotes. You'll hear funny bird sounds. So these are the areas we return to because eventually we're going to get that little thing on video cam. I put out, I'll have 10 trail cams put out. Darren, I have oh, wow. two around the camp. We're deploying two drones this year, a large one and a small one. See what we can catch from the air. What kind of drones are you guys using? They're Vendatar drones. They're only good for the day. At okay. nighttime, my night vision binoculars are, I can record, they have SIM cards. I can record through them, but not at a distance. And I'll give an example in a minute on that. My video cam, which has voice recording, it records at night too. But you're only limited by distance. Example, I was over in St. Mary's. And I have two photographs of something avoiding something black. It looks like your shoulder avoiding the trail cam. My trail cam is set anywhere from six and a half to seven and a half foot off the ground. So it's not a bear. I've gotten deer, elk, moose, wolves on the trail cams already. The night we went out with my stepson, glass, and I had what appeared to be a juvenile looking at us through the trees. Wow. And I tried to get a, a recording when I dropped the binoculars and put them back up. It's gone. A little later, I was scanning a tree line. And there was a large one standing there watching us. Just after that, me and Josh was standing there, and a big log came flying between the two of us from behind. Oh, oh hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Cat. Okay, here we go. You guys are watching the tree line, and all of a sudden, a huge log gets thrown at you? Yeah. Coming from behind us, so there was more than one there. Oh, dude, they were sneaky. They snuck up behind you, and they were uh -huh. going to take you out from behind. Yeah, so we decided it was probably prudent to leave. Wow. To go back <laughs> to the motorhome in the house. Yeah. But I did a, the call, the whoo call. Okay. And I got coyotes in response, but weren't coyotes. Have you gotten interesting audio on recorded when you're out there, are you always recording audio or? Yes, I have. Yeah. A, I also have a sonic listening device which these headphones go to. Oh sure. So I can pick up anything in the distance, and it does record, and I put it in on cassette, which then I transfer it over to a flash drive. Is what I was looking for today. I probably have 21 recordings of different sounds I've actually recorded myself. Mm. So when I do get those out, I'll send them to you. Yeah, like thank you. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And like I said, they're here. Phillipsburg Drummondary is cattle country. During the calving season, calves come up missing. It's not wolves taking it. They actually footprints lean away. Whoa, really? So you're, I would guess ranchers are finding these footprints? Yeah. And they're like large, they're pretty much Bigfoot type footprints, it's you're saying? They're 18 to 22 inches. Yeah, you know, I, I consider that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, even during uh, pawning season for deer, cabin season for elk and moose, I'm sure Bigfoot takes the babies. This is an animal that's capable of killing a, a deer, an elk. In the history of it, in 1851 in Arkansas, two guys watched a Bigfoot chasing cattle, trying to grab it. And... 1846 I actually found 22 inch tracks in the snow. That's in Arkansas. Part of doing research for Bigfoot, you've got to find when the first 
our kind of recordings, not our consumer, like we talk about the Native American, because it's there in pictographs and in legends. If sure. you talk to the Pawnees in the Southwest, the war they had with them, the natives up on the West Coast, the war they had with Bigfoot, and where there was uh. plenty of tropes growing, what you want to do, go back. Now, the earliest account I've been able to find is 986 AD, and that's Leif Erikson in Newfoundland. He describes large, hairy, smelly creatures that were very aggressive. And then in 1793, Santiago, I can't say his pronounced name, he sure. was commissioned by the Spanish king to explore the West Coast of South America and North America. He wrote in his journals of large bipedal creatures. Wow. When Lewis and Clark was headed through the exploring the Louisiana Purchase, they were warned by the Mandans, the Shoshone, the Blackfoot, about large, bipedal men in the mountains that like to steal horses and eat them. And it's in that journal somewhere, and I've been trying to find it. I had the passage at one time. There's a history of it, and it's something we can't ignore. They've been around a lot longer than we have. And whether they come across a land bridge or they're related to giant Pithecus, we don't know. Now, an expedition into Tibet in a real high alpine lake, nobody goes into. They did eDNA, and they come back as 98% human. Now, what we have to understand, there's only 2 to 3% difference in our DNA between us and the giant primates, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, and the orangutans. Interesting. There's a lot out there, and you're going to hear, say, you know, people want the attention. And my standing policy for my group, now, we, I don't want the attention. I want answers. What we learn helps you, the people, come to understand, because the scientists ain't going to tell us. The government sure in the hell ain't going to tell us. So it's up to us individual ones out there willing to take the time. And to, to make the connections with the other groups. And hopefully your research helps out other people and their yes. research helps out yours. And just hopefully people keep connecting and play nice so that can happen. Spring is pretty much confirmed. I've got one research group in Colorado that's coming. I've got the Sasquatch oh. Highway out of Oregon, Bruce. He's coming. And then in the fall, I return to that area twice a year in the spring and in the fall. I've got another group coming out of Texas to do it, and we'll be there for two weeks. Coming to the, your research area. Uh -huh. But we're also the ones out there doing it. We don't talk mm. much about it. I will post um, on the domain or on my Facebook site some of the stuff that we do come across. The first thing I want to know more about is in the name itself, International Research Group. So obviously you guys are researching on Montana, but what is it that makes it an international thing? Oh, I get reports from Wales, Germany, Scotland, the Philippines, Malaysia, Borneo, Thailand, Australia. They have to be international. Because I have members wow. from all over the world. We actually are have twenty three countries. Members in 23 countries. Fascinating. In the encounters, the uh, Cliff Eagle speaker, something the Blackfoot Indian Reservation, talked about what him and his girlfriend saw a bipedal creature walking. And then you go beyond that, and this is all on there. The one in Wales, it was July 18, 2021. A guy was digging a ditch. And he looked up and saw a large bipedal creature walking towards him. And when it saw him, it took off. And then the reports out of Malaysia and Borneo of the Pendeka, which is what they call the Bigfoot down there, it's a smaller one and it's more orangish in color. So we do get these reports. Like I was telling you, I don't know when I'll get a message where somebody has, this is what we've seen. And then what I do is I immediately go online and I start researching. Let's say Wales. How many sightings have been in Wales? You'll be surprised. How many in really? Scotland? How many in England? You always do a follow-up to make sure you're not getting BS. And uh -huh. everything I'm finding is back in what they're telling us. In the research area that the Montana group has, are you all focusing on getting a certain type of evidence or is it pretty much whatever you can find, footprints or audio 
or video, or are you just throwing everything at it? This year, we're going to concentrate on footprints, looking for hair samples. Those that go in the, actually in the field, I want them collecting small, empty bird nests. Birds will use hair to line their nests, hair off of a horse's oh, yeah. neck. Any hair, and I do have a microscope, I can look to see if I've got the root nap that I can send into a lab. We want to get actually better vocalizations. Yeah, and catch something on video. We have the definite proof. And this takes time. It's not something that I don't think people realize just how intense field research is. Absolutely. Because we have two groups during the day. And I try to narrow it to one group at night. Because somebody gets lost, it's a whole lot harder to find them that night than during the day. Especially right. in Montana. Because this is rugged, rough country. That's the thing. Because, And it's not just Bigfoot. You have to be... You have extremely large predators besides Bigfoot up there as well, right? Yes, we have wolves. We have mountain lions. We have black bears. We have grizzlies. Oh, grizzlies. Wow. Yeah, and they're they, they big ones. These are big humpback grizzlies, and they're not friendly. We have to be aware at all times, just not Bigfoot, the apex predators in the area. Coyotes, I don't worry about. Bobcats or lynx, we do have those. Sure. Too, but it's the big, the primary ones, the mountain lions, your wolves, the bears, possibly Bigfoot. Do they take humans? Unknown question. Wow. Have there is there a history of Bigfoot sightings in Montana that you're aware of? I know you you've looked into different um, history reports in different parts of the U.S., but have you found any how far things go back in Montana itself? Oh, there is report will be from Lewis and Clark. Oh, okay, written down. Gotcha. Oh, the native, the Blackfeet, and the Blackfoot in their legend goes they were according to them they were already here. And the Sioux talk about them. Then you get farther south into the southwest, your Pawnee and the Zuni all have a history. They actually have a dance. It's a Bigfoot dance. It's not the oh, really? dance. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is cool. That is cool. So when Whoa. you're doing research, this is the whole thing is you've got to look at everything. You've right. got to have an open mind. You can't be a skeptic and say, oh, that didn't happen. We used to keep on coming across the same thing over and over, but from different sources. There's something, there's a basis there you've got to find out. Mm. Where, why? The old saying, what, where, when, and why? Those are what you're trying to answer. Do you feel like you have adequate evidence to prove its existence in Montana, or are you still reaching for a better piece, hopefully next year? I think we do. I do, but I want that conclusive piece. You know, it's, it's better to be safe than sorry, as they say. And that's why it's just not there that go, because I'm now by myself and I have the big, I have a big mortar on my class A and I tow my Jeep behind. I can go out okay. and spend weeks. As long as I got propane and water, I can be out there doing field research. And it's just a matter of being there at the right time. Yeah. And the one area there's, Unusual things happen is the Beartooth range. People come up missing there and they don't know why. Are you talking about missing 411 stuff? Yeah. They, they really? know there's an aggressive Bigfoot in those mountains that are actually killing people. Wow. So how is it that you say, so have you heard reports or there's been yes. seen that you know it's an aggressive Bigfoot? Somebody's missing. They find them and it looked like they got, the person's gone through a meat tender. So all their bones are crushed. Whoa. Neck's broken. Oh, wow. Skull's crushed in, ribs are crushed, legs are broken. Some have been found wrapped around a tree. Wow, wrapped around a tree. That's yeah. extremely intense. I don't know if you read, heard on that, the drug dealers, the sheriff knew about, they were going to do a bust. They are in your group? No, this is someone else. And Oh, this is a different, because yeah, I saw I it on your group. That yes. was incredible. Yeah. But go on with yours. <laughs> the 911 call they received, they could hear gunfire. And they kept, the people were saying, El Monsterio. Of course, the cops are going to respond. When they got there, it was all quiet. They found all this ammo had been shot. They found mm. the bodies. 
just tore wow. apart. The backside of the trailer was completely ripped open. And this little girl come out, and all she would say, a monster. Oh, the so, monster, right? Yeah. <sighs> you know, Eight Canyon's another one. Those gold prospectors, why did oh, they attack them? But if you listen to what they said, they shot at Bigfoot, killing one and wounding one. Bigfoot re- reprisal was they were going to get those guys. Now, the report you referred to in Beartooth, I'm guessing that kind of behavior isn't anything you would see from uh, a grizzly. Is it almost no. more aggressive than you would see it's from a bear? Aggressive. Really? Yeah, it's more aggressive. A grizzly, if he takes you, he's going to eat you or bury you. Okay. Like, you're not going to be there anymore right. at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And these are different. These are different. And that's <sighs> more reported attacks in the bear tooth by something unknown. And it's bears are ruled out, mountain lions are ruled out. How far back do these missing reports go for bear tooth? 1938. Really? Yeah. And it's been happening all along. It's been happening all along. Oh, man. Wow. If people have never been in the Bob Marshall, the only way in there is by horseback or foot. I used to work for the outfitters as a camp cook during hunting season. Okay. What I saw that day was not a, a bear. What did you see? I'm sitting there watching the slide just across the stream. And I watched a group of elk, a herd of elks come out. They looked at cows. They turned around and took off back the way they had come. What walked out on that trail wasn't a bear. It was walking upright. Black. After you crossed the clearing, the slide, there was two real loud tree knocks. Wow. And that night when the federal game warden in, because I'd asked the outfitter about it, and the outfitter told the game warden, Ken saw the big guy, and the, guy, the game warden started laughing. Ken saw the big guy? That's what <laughs> yeah. they said? Yeah. Oh, man. Then and after the that, warden, it's... It's all bets are off. You must have been like, it's on. Yeah, it's on now. That makes me, yeah. you know, like I was saying, it's just not the only kind. I'll give you another example of why I know I've been around them. I used to run a winter trap line for beaver and coyotes and that off a place off of the Blackfoot. Back okay. then they were logging, so they had the road plowed on, had an area. I set my base camp up and then I'd snowshoe and never used to snowmobile. I had Alaska trails modified. Sure. So I'd make my coyote sets, and I always use conibears, quick kills. I don't believe in animal suffering. I had to left to get supplies and come back now to start running my line, probably about a mile from the camp. One of the coveys was tore up. There was a coyote head in the trap, but no body. Really? Yeah, but you could see tracks leading away, but it was covered with snow. So I continued to where I'd spend the night. Then my next day, I'd come back along Gold Creek itself on my beaver sets. There were beaver traps totally destroyed, pulled out oh, of the water. Man. So something took the, the beaver. Yeah. And there again, tracks. And you're talking tracks 16, 17, 18 inches that were covered in snow. You can definitely no, tell. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. So do you get scared? I think you do, but you become more cautious and alert to your surrounding area. Oh, sure. I have a standing policy when any of my kids go with me, listen to the forest, the woods, the mountains. They're going to tell yeah. you a story. All right. And most people don't listen, understand this, like pine squirrels. If they sound off in the distance, they have an alarm. Pay attention. Okay. Because if they start sounding off as they're coming towards you, that means something's coming. And I've had bears. I've seen bears. Actually, the squirrels are just ahead of the bears. Is that an indicator? Yes. I was going to ask you earlier, the missing people reports in Beartooth, are those things you've just researched yourself or did you find those, were those in a certain area gathered together? Or? I knew one of the deputy sheriffs down in that area. I won't say his name. In that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you <laughs> got the inside. The, yeah. Yeah. You know, to say, to protect him, he knew mm-hmm. I'm into the Bigfoot stuff and he, he got to talking to me. They get at least two, three reports a year. When they hear stuff, they're coming to you. Yeah, I'll get a phone call, say, again, another guy's missing. Now, Chief Joseph, which is the pass out of the bitter rut into Idaho, you swing over there into the big hole. And anybody that knows about the big hole, that's where the Nespers had 
really the first contact with a Calvary when Chief Joseph was escaping from Idaho. They have a sighting of a bipedal creature quite often around that campground. Really? And it's not a bear. So that's on my list this year to actually go in and set up a camp, my motorhome and everything, and spend some time, put out trail cams and try some things. That'll make local news when yeah. that happens. Yeah. People that's, in Montana are real awesome. reserved about talking with the experience. Okay, Unabomber, Lincoln, Montana, where the Unabomber was, was found. Ted Kissins. Oh, man, this episode is going to raise some red flags and algorithms. Let's party. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, when the FBI was staked out the cabin, they yep. watched a mountain lion kill a deer. Ain't no way they're really? going to get all that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. They talked to us. No way they're going to get off that car. There has been reports of the locals, and this thing about people in Montana, they're so close mouth. Now, I do have a member that's going to meet me sometime this summer up at Lincoln to show me some of these areas, which I'm always happy to go to. I look at it as an adventure, but it's an adventure for knowledge, for understanding. What would it take for your quest to be done? To finally verify what I saw was not a bear. Okay. I'm not going to say like guys joke around. Have a sit down with me and have a beer. But no, to be able to say, yes, it wasn't a bear. It was definitely a bipedal creature. Will it take, uh, what kind of evidence would that take? If I can find a uh, thesis where I can get DNA, put prints, we take okay. DNA, take your ground dirt, yeah. which I have all the, I have all the equipment to do it. It's just finding the stuff to do it. I'm going to try to get fingerprints this year, and I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a large beer can opened up beer set out at night. If it's on the ground, I have the dusting powder for fingerprints. Okay. It's finally to prove just not to myself, to others, that, hey, these do exist. This is another thing our government's covering up. Hmm. We, there's so many theories about Bigfoot. I have my own, and I'm sure it's going to conflict with others. But sure. over the years, you develop a theory. What is it? I study the human evolution. And you're surprised, the primates did not evolve like humans, but yet they did evolve. Yes, Bigfoot, an evolutionary takeoff of the primates. A larger giant pithecus, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees. Gotcha. If they're getting DNA and stuff that comes back as unknown primate, then there's something there. Right. The other thing is to find a lab that won't shoot their mouth off to the government. It's like, who can you trust that your evidence is going to magically end up missing and never get returned to you like so often is the case, right? I did. I sent in some DNA samples, some eDNA. Oh, I never heard a word. Really? And that was two years ago. Wow. So what did, what's the results? It either means you found something or there's a lot yeah. of people in the labs that are not so organized. What if you had to put a pin down on a map of Montana for the squatchiest area, what would you think? I think the where area. I'm going again this year because okay. I keep it because something always happens there. And that's the key is now it's being there at the right time. Having mm. enough people out there, out in the field, we're actually going to be putting out a satellite cam. A satellite cam? Yeah. Really? Tell uh, me about that. Yeah, the one, a group from Washington, I'll be taking them into an area. It's about a mile, maybe or maybe only half a mile from an alpine lake. I come across tree structures in that. Well, I'm going to jeep in and tent, sleeping bags, cooking gear, everything. And they're going to spend a few nights in there. Now, they will be in contact with the base camp through the CBs. Both the motorhome and the Jeep has CBs, and they will have a portable. Those in the field have two-way radios, one's in the base camp, and the, the guys have them. I can hear what's going on if they're sure. talking between each other. So I'm curious, is Bigfoot moving from the lakes through that draw up into the bar marshal over the top? into the Bob Marshall. It's just one range on one side and it's the Mission Mountains on the other side. It's a big area. How many hours do you think you've put in over the years for Bigfoot research? If you had to round, <laughs> round it up. <laughs> 1,000, 1,200 hours. Wow, that's awesome. 
That is amazing. I'm limited because of my health, my heart. Oh, sure. I can't get out there like I used to when I was a kid. Okay. If I didn't have a bad heart, I'd be the one out there in a satellite camp by myself. Yeah. But now I have others that do it, and it's hard to get people to come. They don't realize it's important. I have the people there that follow the rules. We do have rules for field research, and we're okay. real strict. You follow these rules. Otherwise, you're removed because you get hurt out there. The closest hospital is 45 miles away. Oh, my goodness. That's game over, dude. And there's no place to bring a helicopter in there. Oh, really? You can't even medvac no. anyone. Out. It's no. really, you're done. Yeah. We had a wow. scene in the ball marshal with the hunters. If your buddy dies, lay him over a log. It's easier to put him on a horse, a pack horse, than oh. if he's flat. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And there's that, truth that'll to make it. a person pay attention. Uh -huh. Yeah. We request that nobody goes armed but myself. And the head of the team say send out so somebody doesn't get gun happy. And I don't like anybody really be carrying a weapon. At yeah. night, I understand, but during the day, I think Bigfoot can sense it. I agree with you. From what I've heard talking to people, I would agree with you on that yeah. for sure. It's weird. You always hear stories about how they can sense certain things or... Yeah. Can they sense IR on like game cams, stuff like that? It's just really interesting stuff. You're really not sure what this creature can and can't do. It's pretty intense for sure. Yeah, see, we changed our flashlights. We don't use white. Okay. We use a high density black light. Oh, interesting. Um, I've shown normally deer and that will have eye shine. Under these, there's no eye shine. Okay. You can see them and there is no eye shine. Gotcha. So does Bigfoot see that color spectrum? We don't know. Yeah. Over the years, all those hours that you're out there, have you ever noticed anything else weird or strange that you're like, it was Bigfoot, but I'm really not sure what's going on here. You mean trees driven upside down in the ground? Okay. That's cool. Yeah. So You've run into that? Yes. Really? You don't find those very often. You're more up north, but you do have one spot here. You'll find X's in a different configuration, blinds during water holes, along game trails and streams, all sorts of weird things. I've run across fish traps there in places where there ain't no humans, and I see those. In the spring, the rainbow trout and the silver salmon spawn. In the fall, the kokanee salmon in that spawn, the brown mm. trout, the brookies. Sure. So those streams have got trout in them, fish, which is a food source that there is like, and I think Bigfoot does too. These fish traps are primitive and that, and, but they're, they work. Expedition Bigfoot, they come across it in Washington, didn't know what it's it true. was. So every, I was telling the wife, I've already been talking about this. We don't, what does Bigfoot eat? Is it a carrion eater? Hmm. We know it'll kill. Kind of, if you look at the edible things if you look at like in montana baby fern cattail young cattail huckleberries raspberries i'm sure they raid farmers fields there's a lot to eat out there then you look at them taking deer taking elk even a moose and they will kill a bear so cubs if it comes across the cub that's food for the bigfoot so you're saying they will kill a bear? Yes. How do you know that? I, I'm just, I'm genuinely curious. How can you come across a bear with a broken neck and there's no gunshot wound and there's nothing around? Okay. So something, a smell in the air smells like something dead and rotten and moldy. Wow. Is that something you've come upon yourself? A or? couple of times. A couple of really? Times. Yeah. You've, you found a bear that has a snap neck. Yeah. Totally dead. And now, is yeah. this like full size adult or what full size, size adult. is One was a really? full size adult. The other one was a cub. The cub had the, uh, one hind quarter missing. They've been torn off. And anybody's doubting me, I'll take a polygraph to any of this stuff because I'm serious about what I see. I've not talked about it until recently of what I've experienced out there. Oh, really? I'm just really taken aback by that. That's incredible because I'm thinking another bear. Probably couldn't. I'm trying to think of creatures that could break or you said break the neck of a bear. That's an intense, Ken. I know. I, I hunt bear. Yeah. 
I know how thick their necks are. Yeah, that'd make me that I would be thinking for a while on that, man. I really can't think of anything yeah. other than Bigfoot that could do something like that, dude. Yeah, or bear will eat, will kill a cub. That's why the sows are so protective of the cubs. Yeah. A sow can get separated from the cubs, get separated. What happens if Bigfoot grabs it? You're talking an animal except eight, nine hundred pounds or more. Yeah. An animal eight, eight and a half foot tall. Extremely muscular. Can you imagine? I'm not sure if anyone has a story of this, but seeing the fight between a grizzly and a Bigfoot, my goodness, wouldn't that be something to go down in the ages? You know, the other thing I've noticed when I'm out, if there's no bears, I generally, that's where I start hearing the weird vocalizations and stuff. I think the bears get the hell out of there. Sure. It's like they're finding out Porpoises are killing great white sharks. If okay. They show up, the great white sharks leave. It's all documented. Yeah, right. Now, the great white shark's an apex predator. A bear is a, a black bear. It's not as powerful as a grizzly. But if they wow. target a small bear, what chance do they have? What chance do we have? Absolutely. You know, you're on the food chain as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure you've heard different recordings of Bigfoot vocalizations and you've mentioned already that you've heard almost uh, mimicry different animals. Have yeah. you heard anything that, you know, a howl or anything where it's okay, that's not like a coyote sound. That's something totally different. Yeah. Yeah. A whooping. Oh, you have heard whoops out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Really? You, they're generally followed by a couple of tree knocks <laughs> and you can distinguish a tree knock from Bigfoot, from a tree, a wind blowing a tree, there's a distinct sound. Okay. It's real loud and clear. You hear it, leave the area. Like I said, in the structures I've come across, there's some, you see them, turn around and get the hell out of there. Don't, do not go any further. They're a warning. Stay out of that area. It's a warning. Yeah. yeah it's a warning. I, I want to say it was my buddy Tate Hieronymus that almost, he labels it like a, a power knock. I've heard that thrown around, but it's it's so sharp. It's so uh, loud that you're just like, it could be nothing else. Yeah, you hear it. They could be two, three miles away. There's no mistaking when they do it. We cannot create that lot of tree knocker sales. Ours sure. are short and sharp, but short. There's, you hear it through thick woods, everything. You'll hear that knock. When they scream, sometimes it sounds like a woman. Very interesting because, uh, yeah. So you've heard that yourself, where uh-huh. it's like a sc- it, like a woman scream. Oh It'll man! Make you stand up and look around. Oh, do you have any of that recorded? Yes, you do. So oh. I'll get those recordings out. I okay. got to go through all my flash drives and find them, and then I'll get them sent to you. <laughs> No pressure, but I would love to hear it. That's <laughs> awesome. Have you ever played like a, a baby cry sound? I'm trying that. Oh, you're going to try that this year? Yeah. yeah. You got to tell me how it goes. I will. It what usually brings out the crazy. You got some wild post, stuff in that group. Yeah. That's why. And we're a private group for a reason. Right. We, me and the, my moderators, we have one primary thing. You will be respectful. Yes. If you troll somebody, especially me, yep. you ain't got a chance. You're gone. Your history. I will not tolerate it. And we built a group of trust. Yeah, that's we important. can talk about the experiences. Look at the guy that contracted with Border Patrol, what he saw. Yeah. It takes a lot for these people to talk about these experiences. Don't oh, troll absolutely. Because trust me, I verify everything anybody's saying. It's not that hard to do. It's just go to the area. You'll learn how to do research online for information. Like I posted that you notice, I don't post anything on there that I have not double checked. It has to be more than one article. That's awesome. Because I'm online from two, three o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting here doing research. I have two really left field things I want to ask you about that if you've ever heard anything like about this kind of thing in Montana. It's really left field. Have you ever experienced any like orb stuff up there? I have in Idaho. Oh, you have? (laughs) Oh, that night we had that log thrown between us. Yeah. Just prior to that, we were standing. I looked up. It was about five miles away. I'd say 
quite a ways up in the sky, a red orb was dancing all over the sky. It wasn't a helicopter and it wasn't an airplane. Oh, we it was like going diagonals and stuff? It was doing this. Really? And stuff. It would disappear. We watched <sighs> it for 45 minutes. I tried to catch it on the camera and that it was too far away. Oh, wow. Now, okay. I had, that's cool. Where I caught the wolves on trail cam. Mm-hmm. I haven't figured out how to piece the video together, but I have, it looks like an orb coming up this draw and it slowly floats across the trail cam. Wow. And then it comes back and then comes back and then it's gone. Okay. Yeah, and that's wild. There's seven videos of it. Man, that's awesome. The night after we caught that juvenile, I woke up, something was chattering outside of the window of the motorhome on my ceiling. I looked up and there was a white orb dancing on the ceiling and it just went out inside the, the motorhome uh-huh. back and forth. Yeah. I nudged uh, the wife and said, look at that. Oh no. And then, I don't know how I deal with that. You lay there like, what the hell? I got <laughs> up. Quite- yeah. I got up and fully charged dual batteries in a motorhome had gone completely dead. They were completely really? dead. 20 minutes and they come back online full charge no way i'm serious oh that's crazy ken wow i don't know how you explain that yeah Yeah. you can't you can't i don't know that's the thing so the way i i think about it is there's no right or wrong answers yet for the creature because we don't have one captured so i think it's i I think it is like an animal an ape a creature but it's think of the animals around the world and all the weird stuff they can do who's to say that bigfoot has like these crazy stuff that we have never even thought an animal can do like all bets are off interdimensional travel cloaking i've never experienced it but i'm not going to discount it because i've never experienced (laughs) i only base everything i talk about i base on my experience Either sure. in the field or online researching. And people don't understand that. I have all the time in the world to do this. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'm 70. <laughs> I got all the time in the world. All right. Number two, left field. There's a creature in cryptozoology where it's labeled as like a pale crawler, humanoid, weird thing i don't know if that doesn't ring any bells don't worry about it but just in the off chance okay i've never experienced it personally i'm not saying they're not out there yeah okay good example i'd like to meet the farmer in deer lodge he's got one of those on a trail cam who oh there's a rancher out of deer lodge his cattle was come up missing, so he put out a bunch of trail cams. He has something like that on one of the trail cams. A farmer, this is Deer Lodge, Montana? Uh-huh. Can you get me in touch with him? I'll try to, yeah. Okay. I want to meet him. I want to go where it was at. You got to. Yeah. Dude, oh my goodness. The thing about research, field research, you have more questions than answers. Absolutely. And the oh, more that's you go exciting. Out to do it, the more questions you're going to have I know. than answers. But oh, there's wow. always that one moment when something may happen that you're not a believer, it can make you a believer. When I was That's young, wild. I swore I'd never jump out of an airplane. I finally did it. You did it. <laughs> yeah, I got, when I was living in Hawaii, I spent time in Hawaii. I was there 14 years on the island of Kauai. You hear about okay. the Menahunis. Yes. Tell me what a small footprint in the Akai Swamp which is one of the highest plateaued swamps in the world. It's actually at the base of the wettest place in the world at 485 inches of rain a year. Wow. What is that little footprint doing up there? The many hoonies are the ones that built the fish pond. They don't. They call it the many hoonie ditch when the Hawaiians got there. Kauai was the first islands the Hawaiian Polynesians landed on. There was already a ditch built, and they don't know who built it. Wow. It's perfectly angled for water flow and everything. And it Man. goes right through rocks at all. It's got a tunnel and everything. Nobody knows who wow. built it. It's like our medicine wheel in Wyoming. Nobody knows who built it. It was there when the Native Americans come into that area. What's the medicine wheel? If you're in the air, like the Aztec lines, you okay. see it on the ground. But if you're in the oh, air, yeah. it's a great big wheel with spokes. Okay. The medicine wheel. It's a sacred place for the Native Americans. It yeah, was there wow. when they got there. That's wild, dude. You hear 
the people before, constantly the people before. Are there mounds in Montana? Eastern Montana, around the Mandan villages, there's a few, but not yeah. what's on the East Coast in the in Tennessee. Not like Ohio, but, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. mounds there. Most of it here, I'm sure, is bur- burial. Okay. And that you don't, I respect the natives here. Sure. And I don't believe in disturbing them. Anything. Absolutely not. If I can get one to talk to me, and once you really get snowy, they will open up. I'm hoping oh, yeah. this year to sit down with the chief of the Blackfoot up here on out of our league. Oh, wow. And sit down with him and the medicine man and talk to him. They know who I am. But it's taken years to build if I'm that close. That's the thing people don't understand, I think, is how long it takes to create relationships like that. It will literally take years and today's culture doesn't get that in a world where you can just click. I want to be your friend. It's not like that. You have to spend years. It's wild. Yeah, and then the other one too, if you look at it, during the pandemic, the reservation, the big one, the black one, east of the divide, it was shut down. It was closed. You couldn't go in there. Oh, wow. Up here, because you have to drive through to get to Flathead Lake. Now, Flathead Lake, there's been reports of footprints, something stinky walking on the east side of Flathead Lake. Really? Yeah. So we, they're here. We don't hear a lot. There's more Bigfoot sightings in Montana than most people realize because we don't talk about it. That's our problem. We're not talking about it. Gotcha. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Thank goodness for the Montana Bigfoot International Research Group. You guys are trying to get all the evidence together. That's awesome. Yeah. And it takes time. Yeah, yeah. I got to have it before I die. Come on now. <laughs> You'll get it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I'm actually going to do gold prospecting to see if that'll Oh, you are. Oh, wait. So you're going to you're going to prospect for gold. Hopefully you'll get some Bigfoot uh-huh. evidence at yeah. the same time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, be careful. You got those stories of up in Canada where the prospectors and the just have your eyes behind you. Don't let a anyone good sense sneak of up hearing by and a good sense of smell. There you go. There you go. And that, <laughs> yeah. but I really appreciate them having me come on board. Like I said, this is my first time I've actually talked to somebody about experiences and what oh, we're awesome. doing yeah. and everything. Yeah, Ken, I appreciate you coming on and, and chatting tonight. This has been a really fun chat. There's more going on in Montana than I realized. Do you mind taking a few minutes? If you have any closing thoughts, definitely say those, but remind people how they can keep up to date with the Montana Bigfoot International Research Group and how they can contact you and all that good stuff. Yeah, they can contact me through my email dogman129 at msn.com. It's on the domain, the www, the Montana Bigfoot Research Group dot okay. com. My Facebook group is the Montana International Bigfoot Research Group. Bigfoot, yeah, International Research. But it's on Facebook. You can find it on there. We are private. If somebody wants to join, please answer the questions because they automatically declined. And we got to set up that way. We're not a large group, but we're building. We're slowly building. And we have people that have experiences. They're talking about it. We finally got them to talk about it. And we, even if you're in Montana or you're coming through and want to spend some time on a field research, get a hold of me. Awesome. We'd welcome. We'll take you out there and mm. be part of it. You might be there when we finally find that one thing we're looking for to prove what we're looking for. I think how neat that would be. That would be very cool. Ken, it has been a delight chatting with you, and I'll definitely be probably touching base with you again in the future. And yeah, it'd be a good time. But thanks so much for coming on, Ken. Thank you for having me. And if I come across something in May exciting, I'll let you know immediately. Fantastic. You'll be on the group site. (laughs) Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners, for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me 
at bigfootsociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's the list. All right, I'm going to use this space uh, this week to announce that I'll be at the Sasquatch Summerfest in Oak Ridge, Oregon as an attender. I won't be presenting or anything, but I'll be hanging out trying to interview people that have had Bigfoot encounters. If you're from the Oak Ridge, Oregon area or surrounding and you've had a Bigfoot experience, please contact me directly, bigfootsociety at gmail.com. Also, Priscilla was nice enough that if you get your tickets through sasquatchsummerfest.com and use code BIGFOOTSOCIETY, you can get 50% off the cost of your tickets, which is a big amount. So uh, code BIGFOOTSOCIETY to get 50% off your tickets, sasquatchsummerfest.com, and uh, helps out the podcast as well. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it.